much for joining me today. We are going to be continuing our study of Daniel and we're going to be taking a look at Daniel 4. Let's pray as we get started. Oh Lord, we just come to you today and we thank you for today. We thank you that we get to open your word. We thank you uh, that we even have your word to read and to be formed by God. I pray that as we continue to study uh, your word, God, that you will transform us and mold us into the people that you want us to be. We love you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Daniel 4, we are just moving right along. And I hope you've really been enjoying this study because I have very much been enjoying it. And so we get to Daniel 4. And in these first four chapters, we've seen a lot of different things. But there's been one character that has made an appearance in every single one of these chapters. And it's not Daniel. Remember, Daniel was not uh, mentioned in Daniel 3. And it's not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, because they are only mentioned in 1 and 3. Or why is they're mentioned in 2 as well? 1, 2, and 3. It's actually King Nebuchadnezzar. And I think that's a very interesting thing. As we've been kind of going along, we've been talking a whole lot about how Daniel and his friends were able to maintain their identity and as followers of the one true God, even in the midst of uh, serving, being trained for service and serving in the kingdom of, of the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar. But Nebuchadnezzar has been mentioned throughout these first four chapters. And so we're going to be taking a little bit of a deeper look at um, him today, which I think is so fascinating. So Nebuchadnezzar, in some ways, we could say that these first four chapters, one of the things that kind of rises to the surface is we see Nebuchadnezzar's growing awareness of who God is and his growing understanding of his place in relationship to who God is. We see his, gro his growing awareness of these exiles and his opinion of these, these um, young men and how they seem to have this extra measure of understanding, this extra measure of um, just wisdom and how God is at work in them, even though he doesn't necessarily attribute it to God, not in the first chapter. Um, but they rise, they rise to the forefront. In chapter two, we see Daniel and his friends be able to interpret the king's dream, or Daniel is specifically the one who interpreted, interprets it. Um, and we see that um, King Nebuchadnezzar is very much aware that something is going on here. He says in 2 verse 47, Surely your God is the God of gods and the Lord of kings and a revealer of mysteries for you were able to reveal this mystery. So we see this dawning of awareness of, of God and that there is this authority that has this seems to have a lot of power at a minimum. So then we move on to last week's passage when we talked about uh, chapter three and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego specifically. And Nebuchadnezzar seized firsthand pa the power of God to deliver, to deliver them from the fiery furnace in grand fashion. And right, and he concludes this section by, you know, says, servants, he calls them servants of the most high God when he calls them out. And he issues this decree that the people, this is in um, 3 verse 29, that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego should be cut to pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble for no other God can save in this way. And so we get this impression that Nebuchadnezzar is just kind of in awe of God's power and it and is starting to at least understand that part um, of who God is. Because he says, praise be to the God, to, uh, to their God, and recognizes that God rescued them. But still not fully believing God or understanding his position in relationship to God. Which brings us to Daniel 4. And this is such a fascinating chapter. Because in some ways it, it functions as kind of the climax of Nebuchadnezzar's um, story and inter of his interaction with God and his dawning awareness is kind of, well, because after this point, 
we don't get any more of his story in Daniel because it switches to um, Belshazzar and then moves on to the Persian Empire, which we will talk about next week when we discuss uh, Daniel 6. But this week specifically, it highlights King Nebuchadnezzar and his experience after having this another dream. And so he starts up, and one of the interesting things is this chapter, Daniel 4, is told from Nebuchadnezzar's perspective. We get, it's in his words, it is, is the way it is written. So I wanted to read a few verses here at the beginning, because he kind of sets it all up and bookends this his experience with, with what he learns out of the experience. So Daniel 4... I'm going to read the first uh, first three verses. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. So here we have this pagan king, King Nebuchadnezzar, who destroyed the temple in, in Jerusalem, who carted all of those art, all of those uh, sacred objects off to Babylon, saying that the Most High God it has an, an eternal kingdom and has dominion from generation to generation, and then he launches into what happens to him, and. He tells of, he tells a story of having another dream and he calls all of his uh, astrologers and wise men in and they are unable to tell him the dream. Now this time he does tell them what the dream is. He doesn't just expect them to um, know it like he did back in chapter two, but he, they can't do it. And so then Daniel comes in and he talks to Daniel and he um, tells him what the dream was. And he has this dream about a tree and how it grew really large and strong. This is in chapter four, uh, starting in verse nine is when he starts to lay out this dream. So he has this vision of this tree, this dream of this tree, and it grew really large and it had beautiful leaves and abundant fruit. And, and there was, um, what, there were wild animals that found shelter under it and birds lived in its branches and creatures were fed because of this tree. And then while he is laying there and still dreaming, there was a holy messenger. He was a holy one, a messenger. That's in verse 13. That come, comes down from heaven and calls out, cut down the tree and trim off its branches and strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. And then the animals flee and the stump and its roots are bound with iron and bronze and they remain in the ground in the grass of the field. And so we get this picture of this tree has been cut off, cut down. And then he says, let him... Um, the messenger goes on to say, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven and live with the animals among the plants of the earth and let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given the mind of an animal till seven times pass by for him. And so he tells this dream to Daniel and Daniel um, through, through God's wisdom and God's power is able to interpret this dream. That was something that one way that God has moved in Daniel's life, and we've seen it so far, and we're going to see it again here. But I wanted to highlight here in verse 19, because this dream, as you may know, is not going to spell good news for King Nebuchadnezzar. And we're going to read parts, um, what happens over here in a few minutes, um, starting in verse uh, 28, I believe. Yes, verse 28. But I wanted to talk about how Daniel responds first. So in verse 19, Daniel said, Daniel, we, we find out how Daniel reacts initially. He says, then, so this is Daniel 4, verse 19. Then Daniel, also called Belteshazzar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, 
Belteshazzar, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Belteshazzar answered, my lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. So we get this sense that Daniel is deeply moved and deeply concerned that about the message of this dream. He knows that it is not good news for Nebuchadnezzar. And he is very hesitant, maybe reluctant to share the interpretation with him. And I think it is so interesting. And we'll, we'll, uh, because here we have Daniel and he is standing before the king who destroyed his homeland and carted him and his friends off to Babylon as exiles and forced them to be re-educated to serve in his kingdom. And finally, here is a dream that uh, God is showing Daniel is going to bring about um, some judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar for his pride, as we'll discuss here in a few minutes. And Daniel seems to be genuinely distraught by this, but not in the sense of, oh, I don't want to tell the king bad, bad news because he'll get mad at me, but because he seems to genuinely care for King Nebuchadnezzar. So let's go ahead and skip ahead here to um, verse 27. So he says what will happen. He says, you're going to be driven away from the people and you're going to live with the wild animals. And he goes on and explains what's going to happen, how he's going to be stripped of his kingdom, but it will be restored. But then he says this in verse 27, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that your prosperity will continue. So Daniel doesn't just interpret the dream. He then goes on to give King Nebuchadnezzar advice. King Nebuchadnezzar didn't ask for that, but Daniel offered it. He you know, said, renounce your sins, renounce your pride, and so repent, but also change your ways and change the way your kingdom is functioning, the way your government is, is going here. And let's, let's look out for the people who are oppressed and uh, be kind to them. And then, so that's what he says here. And it's so, I, I just find it so staggering that here Daniel is hearing, hearing the message that this king who destroyed his homeland is going to go through a, a very degrading trial. And his response is to be concerned and his response is to offer advice. And the other thing I think that's interesting here is that Daniel had the relationship capital capital to be able to give King Nebuchadnezzar advice. He had been serving faithfully and had been able to uh, also maintain his own integrity and his own uh, identity as a follower of the one true God. And so he, and so he was able to speak into this situation because he had uh, been serving so faithfully, but also had maintained enough distance to be able to speak into it from the outside. So now let's go ahead and read Daniel 4 verses 28 through 37. And this is going to be Nebuchadnezzar's account of what happened uh, as a result of this dream. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what is decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will, and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from his people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of that time, 
I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward the toward heaven, and my san- sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. What a crazy story. So here we see God very much dealing with King Nebuchadnezzar. The first thing that I noticed right off the bat is that it took 12 months for this to be carried out. Nebuchadnezzar had 12 months to heed Daniel's advice of renouncing his sins and turning and changing his ways, but he didn't. And let's look at what he says in verse 30. Is this, is not this the great Babylon I have built? By, the, by my mighty power, for the glory of my majesty. And we saw back in chapter three, in the whole statue and fiery furnace incident, that, you know, he says, you know, who is going to be able to rescue you from my hand? He, he kind of has this, almost this God complex, where he was thinking that all of the things that had happened in Babylon, all of the things he could see were a result of him. And his, his awesomeness. But we know that's not true, right? We, we know that God is the one who allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to have that power. And so we see God taking him to task, taking Nebuchadnezzar to task for his pride and his arrogance and his thinking that everything he had done was his own. But he had done it under his own power. And so we see Nebuchadnezzar drift into what we can really understand as some sort of a mental illness where he had a delusion of thinking he was an animal um, and behaved like an animal. There is an actual mental illness that um, does drive people to do that. The irony here, or you could call it poetic justice. Uh, one of the commentators I was reading this week called it poetic justice that the one who thought that he was like a god became, was reduced to thinking he was a beast, that he was less than human. So he thought he was acting like he was more than human, but he was reduced to less than human, which is an interesting, ironic, poetic justice kind of turn of events here in this story. And it says that it takes seven times will pass by, and it's just really a vague amount of time We could hear in that it was going to take as long as it took to have um, Nebuchadnezzar realize the the reality that was before him, that God was sovereign, is sovereign, and was the one that had given him everything. And um, God rules over all. And so that it takes that long, however long it was going to take. And so we get this picture of Nebuchadnezzar just descending into insanity and not not able to function in the world of humans for a while. And then he finally is humbled to the point where he is able to recognize God and praise God for who he is. And he does, and he echoes some of what he said at the very beginning of chapter four, that God is has um, an eternal kingdom that stretches from generation to generation and all the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. And he does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples on earth. And he, he, uh, one of the commentators I was reading really calls this a conversion of sorts that he really did come to understand not just who God is, but his right 
relationship in there, his right standing in relationship to God. Uh, and that's very interesting. When you think about Babylon and how, how grand it was as an empire, and you think about like the hanging gardens of Babylon or one of the wonders of the world, of the ancient world, and all of the, the things that happened in that season, but yet he came to realize where he fell in relationship to who God is. And it's so ama amazing. And so with that, we've come to the end of Nebuchadnezzar's part of the story. And we're going to be moving on to Daniel 6 next week. So Daniel 5 was the story of King Belshazzar and the writing on the wall. One of the things I wanted to point out, and really it's more of a, this might be something interesting for you to do, is to go back and read over Daniel 1 through 4 and Nebuchadnezzar and who he was and how he saw him himself and his dawning awareness of who God is and compare it to chapter five and King Belshazzar and how um, he behaved and what he, his, what he thought about God and how he was called um, into judgment for that. I think it's an interesting comparison and just kind of read through chapter five. Don't skip over it. I mean, the writing on the wall, it's a fascinating story. Um, but we are not going to have time to talk about it as much as I would love to. But still, uh, consider reading it and thinking through those things. So I hope this has been really interesting for you. I know it has been for me just to think about how God was at work in the midst of a pagan kingdom and in, a, in the life of a pagan king that God cared enough about him, about Nebuchadnezzar, to... Um, walk, walk with him through this crazy, um, experience and show him who he really was. Um, it says a lot about who God is and how his sovereignty works and how he is at work, um, everywhere. And he's not bound to any one geographic place. I think that's so cool. And how awesome, how awesome is God and how awesome it is that we get to have a relationship with him. So I'll see you again next week as we move on to Daniel 6. Bye.